fools, they are still saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know about you guys, but as a young boy, I had no idea who Richard Stans was. But I understood that this guy must be important because he was in our Declaration of, or not a Declaration of Independence, our, um, our Pledge of Allegiance. And of course, I was confusing the, the line and to the republic for which it stands. Instead, I heard, and to the republic for Richard stands. Right? I don't, am I the only one who did that? No? Nobody else? Really? It's Richard stands. That's, that's what it was. Well, the next line. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's what we're going to be talking about. Instead, though, we are going to be talking about with liberty and justification for all. And we're going to define what justification is as we continue on through our study. You know, history is full of examples of injustice. And, and injustice these days, it's kind of a hot topic, isn't it? Because everybody's a victim right? Everybody's a victim. No, no, not everybody's a victim. Here's some real life examples of injustice. Think about in the Bible, Joseph, he was unjustly sold as a slave, and then he was unjustly imprisoned. That's injustice. And then of course, Paul the apostle, unjustly beaten on many occasions, unjustly put in prison on many occasions as well. Think about just after World War II, the Nazis, the war criminals. Many of them escaped and lived in places like Argentina where they lived out their lives in peace. Their justice was not deserved on those people. Or perhaps one of the most famous cases of injustice in our country. Anybody remember the white glove? O.J. Simpson, right? He literally got away with murder, right? Injustice. Maybe you're here a victim, a true victim, maybe of divorce or adultery, betrayal of a family member or friend, something's gone wrong in business and somebody cheated you out of money. Maybe physically or emotionally somebody has hurt you and they seem to have gotten away with it. Maybe some injustice there. And yet there is only one who is completely innocent. And yet he was put to death unjustly for, the, for all of humanity. Of course, that's Jesus. And he did it. He did it so that as many as want forgiveness can have it and receive liberty and justification for all. Today we're going to look at a bird's eye view of some of the supplementary laws that are, that are really, um, you know, just a, an explanation of the Ten Commandments. And we're going to see that God is just and God wants to provide protection for all his people. We know that sin must be punished. And even, even on our, our opening <laughs> slide here, there's scales there, right? Scales speak of, is the person guilty or not guilty? And then, of course, we know that we are sinful. And Jesus took the judgment that we deserve so that we could have that forgiveness of sin and then of course finally we'll end it up today with we should be instruments of god's mercy love and forgiveness and so let's go ahead and pray lord we thank you so much for this time today lord we thank you that you will be our teacher today and i i pray god that you would speak to each one of us on an individual basis and Lord, that we would grab a hold of Micah chapter 6, verse 8, which says, he, who, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord desires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, chapter 21. We're going to start here in verse 22. But we're going to be skipping around bits and places, okay? So keep, keep on your toes, right? Chapter 21, verse 22, this first section that we're going to talk about is and justice for all women, children, servants, victims, and foreigners. All right, chapter 21, starting in verse 22, it says, 
If men fights and hurts a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. Here's a case where there is a woman and, and the, apparently there's a fight between two guys and she's caught in the middle and she is injured. And what happens? She gives birth prematurely. Maybe there's some problems with the baby who is born prematurely or maybe she even miscarries. There must be restitution. In other words, God values life and God is protecting the woman and the unborn child. There are consequences for that. Now, of course, today in our country, abortion is legal. However, in our country, did you guys know about this law? It's the Unborn Victims of Violence Act of 2004, and it's summarized like this. Federal law recognizes an embryo or a fetus in utero as a legal victim. If they are injured or killed during the commission of any of over 60 listed federal crimes of violence, the law defines child in utero as a member of the species Homo sapiens at any stage of development who is carried in the womb. Interesting, huh? Because you've got opposing ideologies. You've got this law that says a baby, even an unborn baby, is still a human. And if there's any injury or death towards that little baby that's unborn, a person could be held liable in, in the sense of, let's say, uh, you know, so there's a murder that's committed against a woman who is pregnant and she dies and the baby dies. Well, what happens? That person will be charged for a double homicide. However, what happens? Abortion is also legal. So a woman can choose to murder her own child. Think about that. That's injustice. Now, perhaps there are some listening who've had an abortion. You know, God is the God of forgiveness. God is the God of restoration. And you see that over and over and over. And so don't beat yourself up, but make sure that you have been become right with the Lord. All right? Now, so these laws are given for the protection of people. Let's continue on. Chapter 21, look at verse 24. It says, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. Okay, so here is, here's victims of physical abuse. And in those days, of course, there was slavery. The Bible didn't condone it, but it says, yeah, it happens. And so here's if, if somebody is abusing their servant, or perhaps in our days we can call them employees, but there was supposed to be restitution. The servant would go free. This is to protect those servants. All right, let's continue on. Look at uh, chapter 21. Now let's go to verse 28. Chapter 21, verse 28 says, if an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. But if an ox tends to thrust with its horn in times past, it has been made known to the owner and it, he has not kept it confined so that it has killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death. If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life. Whatever is imposed on him, whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to its judgment, it shall be done to him. If the ox gores a male or female servant, he shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Okay, so this is justice for personal um, property, right? Property, land, income, those type of things. So, now if a person 
is accidentally killed by an ox. Okay, so ox with horns or even gets trampled or whatever. You know, if there's an accident, well, it's an accident and, and unfortunately accidents happen. However, if this ox had a tendency to be aggressive towards people and, you know, they, they start to have an, a, a, a tendency to thrust at people with their horns and you know about it, but you don't really do anything about it. You don't keep that ox properly confined and keep people away, but you know, it's okay, it, 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 he's not gonna hurt anybody, right? Or if this ox had a tendency to do that and you're thinking, I can't, I, I spent a lot of money for this animal. This animal is a really strong animal and helps me with the plowing of my farm and all this kind of stuff. I need to keep this animal. However, if that animal kills somebody and you knew about it, you could be charged with murder, right? It was neglect of keeping your animal under control. Now the same thing happens. It, see, it was an avoidable accident. The same thing happens today. How? Things like DWI. Nobody's forcing anybody to drink while driving, are they? There's not a for, there's, you're not going to put a gun to your head and say, I want you to drink, you know, this, you know, thing of tequila or whatever it is, and I want you to drive drunk and I want you to kill somebody, right? Nobody's forcing that. That is an avoidable accident. Same thing, and here's something I think all of us need to be very careful on. Texting, right? Texting while driving. It's easy to do. You hear the beep and you're like, oh, I was waiting for this or who's that or whatever. And all of a sudden you're looking at it and it could be a head-on collision. See, these are avoidable accidents. And see, the Bible says that there will be, people are held accountable for avoidable accidents, right? Let's continue on. Look at verse 33. Chapter 21, verse 33 says, And if a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, an ox or a donkey falls in it, and, an or, uh, and the owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. If one man's ox hurts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money from it. And the dead ox they shall also divide. Or if it was known that the ox tended to thrust in times past, it has its owner has not kept it confined, he shall pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be its own. Chapter 22, verse 1. If a man steals an ox or a sheep or, and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox or donkey or a sheep, he shall restore double. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animal and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the beast of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that it's stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall make, shall surely make restitution. If a man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand to his neighbor's goods. Okay, so again, this is protection. This is justice for people's personal property, their land, their income. And so again, just like with the ox killing a person, if the ox kills another animal that somebody else's, there's got to be restitution. And then it deals with theft, property, people's personal property. If somebody is stealing and they, uh, let's say they stole some animals and they sold the animals or they killed the animals and they had a great barbecue and invited everybody over and, uh, and the, there's no more animals, right? Well, what happens if it was an ox? You got to pay him five times. If it's, a, if it's sheep, it's four times. You will remember in Luke chapter 19 where Zacchaeus, 
You know, the wee little man, right? He went up a tree and he saw, he was longing to see Jesus. He was convicted and he realized that he needed to get right with God. Why? Because he wasn't stealing oxen and sheep. He was extortion. He was extorting money out of people. As a tax collector, you could charge anybody as much as you wanted and even unjust and unfair taxation rates and people would have to pay it otherwise. He could call the Roman soldiers and have you arrested. And then you still have to pay, right? And so Zacchaeus invites Jesus over to his house, or actually Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus is so happy to be with Jesus. And he announces, hey, today I'm going to repay everybody, everybody that I've ripped off, I'm going to repay them four times back what I owe them. And then I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. So he took responsibility and he made it right. It also talks about if somebody breaks into your house at night and you kill the person, you will not go to jail. You'll, you won't be guilty for that, for killing that thief. However, if the sun has risen and you kill the guy, you could be liable for his death. Here's how it happens, okay? You're asleep. You hear something at night. A bump goes, you know, in the night. You, somebody's breaking in and you're dreaming. Maybe you're dreaming of a white Christmas. I don't know what you're dreaming about, but you, you're up and you're like, oh, somebody's breaking into me to my house, you grab your baseball bat or your club and you're like, I gotta protect my wife and my kids. Somebody could kill them. We don't, I don't know what's going on. You're startled, you grab your, your weapon and you go and you, you beat the guy and the guy gets hit on the head and he dies. According to the Bible, you're not guilty. Here's why, because it's at night, you can't see, you don't know if the guy has a knife or a club or if he's going to, you know, you don't know what's going on. You're startled, you're half asleep and all, of it, all of it, adrenaline just kicks in, right? However, during the day, if somebody breaks in, you can see them and you take your baseball bat or your club or whatever it is and you beat the guy so that he dies. Well, there could have been to where you could say, you know what? I've beat him down, I've called the neighbors, I've called, you know, people are coming around, they heard a commotion, and what happens? It's to restrain you from beating that guy to death, okay? It was justice. Yeah, the guy's gonna have to pay for his crimes, but you don't have to go that far and kill him if you're awake and alert and he doesn't, you know, he's not threatening your guys' life. So that's how that happens, okay? We just also read about if an animal of yours gets out breaks out and breaks into somebody else's property and, and eats all their, their grain or their corn or whatever produce they have, their, their vineyards, whatever it is, you're responsible for your animal destroying their crops because that was their living, right? Also, if you got a fire, you made a fire. How many of you guys like to make fires in your fire pit in your backyard? Yeah, especially during this time of year, it's a good thing to do, it's fun. But what happens if that fire, you know, you, you, I mean, you, you know, especially guys, I don't know about you guys, you ladies, but us guys, we like to burn things. The bigger the fire, the more exciting it is, right? And so we build this big old bonfire and what happens? The wind comes through and it takes some embers away and then it lands on top of our neighbor's roof or in their backyard or on their shed and it burns it down. Well, the Bible says we would be liable for that damage, right? You see, all these laws are to prevent, to, oh yeah, you know what, I need to make sure that I, that, that I don't build such a big fire, that I, that I make sure I'm responsible for my animals and all those type of things. Let's talk about the underprivileged. Chapter 22, so go to chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 21 says, you shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So let's talk about those people who were foreigners. He says, first off, remember you were once a stranger in the land of Egypt. 
So the Bible tells us to be kind and fair to immigrants. Now think about this. In the Old Testament, there was a provision, somebody like Ruth. Do you guys remember Ruth? She was not Jewish. She was a Moabite. She came over with her mother-in-law, and what happened? She started to do what? She started to work, right? She started to become, and she provided for her mother-in-law. She became a very productive member of society. And as a, as a result, one of the, the landowners, his name was Boaz, he says, whoa, this is a woman of excellence. Even though she's a Moabite, she had come to know the Lord. She worshiped the true and the living God. And as a result, he married her and she became the great-grandmother of David, who eventually became the king. Here's a foreigner that, it was, that came, she was welcomed in, and she became a productive member of society. Think about what happened this last Tuesday. In Virginia, the lieutenant governor-elect, her name is Winsome Sears, all right? I think I just lost power here, but that's all right. Well, can you guys still hear me? All right, it's all right. It's okay? You guys can hear me? Yeah, yeah. all good. All right, Winsome Sears. She came to this country from Jamaica at about six years old. And she went to school and she did a good job. Later on, she joined the United States Marine Corps, an honorable person doing an honorable thing. And later on, she, after she got out, she did a lot of great things, worked hard, contributed to the good of her community, and then, of course, now she is now the lieutenant governor-elect of Virginia. And see, here's a good example of somebody coming into a country and being a productive citizen and the country welcoming that type of a person. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that we are to allow immigrants to come in and to break the laws and to have different standards. You see... We see that happening today, don't we? Now, what's the most important issue? What's the most important issue when we see immigrants? For us as Christians, the most important issue is to bring them to Jesus. Even in Exodus chapter 12, there's provision for people to celebrate the Passover. The Lord desires for people to come to salvation, not just Jews, but Gentiles, the foreigners, and so for us, that's got to be our main objective. Whether they come from this country or, and they're non-Christians or they come from another country and they're non-Christians, our job is to do what? Is to share Jesus with them. Let's talk briefly about widows and, and, the ch and children and those who are uh, less disadvantaged. Chapter 22, look at verse 22. So chapter 22, verse 22 says... You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child if you afflict them in any way and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will become hot and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. Okay, so God's saying we need to protect those who are disadvantaged. And of course, that is throughout the Old Testament. You can read so many portions throughout the Old Testament to where the Bible encourages us to help out those who are widows and those who are orphans, those are, who are in poverty, right? Now, with all that, even in the New Testament, it tells us in the book of James, James chapter 1, if we get there, James chapter 1, it says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, for us, for our church, one of the most important things that we do all year is, it's kind of represented in that back corner. It's Operation Christmas Child. And so what do we do? We collect these gifts. We collect little toys or toiletries or school supplies or all these little things for disadvantaged kids 
here in this country, because some boxes go to kids here in this country, but other boxes go to kids um, further afield. And with every single shoe box that's packed, there is the opportunity to do what? To share the gospel of Jesus. And so in a couple of weeks, our church typically, we pack about 200 boxes. It's awesome for the size of our church. It's really good, right? We pack these boxes. And then, of course, we're involved in collecting boxes from other churches in this area. And a lot of people do a lot of work in this church. But that's an example of watching out for those who are disadvantaged. Also, during this time of year, I get a lot of calls. I get a lot of calls from people who say, I don't have um, money to buy you know, food for Thanksgiving or I, I, I don't have money for, uh, for toys for my kids for Christmas. And so here's what I'll do. I'll be discerning because there, there are people out there who, who just kind of go through the phone book and say, well, not phone book, but Google, right? And they said, Church A. And they start with A. Well, we're anchor, so we're kind of on the top of the list. And they find our number and I answer it. And, and you can kind of tell who's kind of working the crowd and who's not. But here's what I'll do is I'll say, hey, if you want that gift card to Walmart for your kid so you can buy Christmas presents for them. I will see you here on Sunday at 10 o'clock. Not 10.05, not 10.02. I will see you here on time. I will see you here awake, not sleeping, not looking at your phone. And afterwards, after church, I'm going to share Jesus with you. And then I'm going to give you your card. Okay? Because I don't want to waste an opportunity. I'm like, yeah, I'll help you out practically. But most importantly, what I want people to do is I want people to know the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. And so that's kind of how we work with this here at our church for the size of church that we have. All right, let's talk about justice in the court of law. Go to chapter 23. Chapter 23, verse 1. You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not show partiality or favoritism to a poor man in his dispute. Skip over to verse 6. Don't worry, we'll come back to verses 4 and 5 in just a second. 23, chapter 23, verse 6 says, You shall not pervert the judgment of the poor in his dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger for you know the heart of a stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Okay. So it says, don't believe a false report. Don't believe a false witness. And of course, Jesus was the victim of false witnesses, right? They tried to find all these guys to bring false testimony against Jesus. So he knows what it's like for injustice to happen to him. And then it says to be fair. Don't show favoritism just because they're poor or don't show favoritism just because they have a lot of money, right? Be fair. You know, there's got to be justice. It doesn't matter what background you have. Don't accept bribes. Watch out for bribes, right? It was true back in that society. It's true in our society. Even James chapter 2 tells us. And right, remember, he's writing this to churches. James chapter 2. And this is, not, this is not characteristic of our church because you guys are loving of everybody. Doesn't matter what they look like, what kind of clothes they have, their background. You guys are incredibly loving of all people. But James chapter 2 tells us, My brothers and sisters, believers in our, Lord, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, 
But you say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? Right? He's writing to churches, and, and it can happen. Sometimes there's an exclusive club in churches, but that's not you guys. You guys welcome everybody from every different background. Keep it up. Good job. All right, so far we can say, we can say the phrase, and justice for all. Again, these laws were put in place for the protection of people. Let's talk about some moral sins. Chapter 22. So go back to chapter 22. Look at verse 16. Chapter 22, verse 16. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed or engaged and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of virgins. Okay. So, here's the, here's the, the idea. Sex outside of marriage. God stipulates that if that, is, that happens, that those people are now committing to get married. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches. And it teaches that sex outside of marriage is a sin. Now, if this happens... And we've talked about the dowry before. Remember the dowry? It's not so much the case in our, our days, but back in ancient times, the father of the bride, he was to provide a certain amount of money or property or could be livestock that would go along with the bride, his daughter, to this new marriage so that if the guy, if the, if the, the new uh, groom, this, this husband... He was horrible to this woman and he divorced her well then she would have a guaranteed income from that dowry or if he died she would have at least that guaranteed income however in this so so in the, the in normal circumstances what happens is the father would provide the money to the new son-in-law okay now if sex outside of marriage happened here's what would happen the the young man would have to come up with the dowry. He would have to pay. And the average price of a dowry was about $16,000, okay? So that young man who decided to have sex outside of marriage with, with this girl, he had to come up with $16,000 and then he had to marry her. And their divorce was not an option, all right? Now, but what happens if the father is looking at this guy. And this guy's a horrible young man. He's going to beat my daughter. He's going to be an abusive husband. He is going to make my daughter and any future grandchildren that I might have their lives miserable. He could say, no way. You're not going to marry my daughter. And you still owe us $16,000 for the dowry. Right? It was a protection. And so there were consequences for these sins. Right? All right. God protects morality. God protects marriage, and he protects the girl because oftentimes the girl would lose her prospects of marriages. And again, again, if this has happened, God is the God of forgiveness. And if people, if this has happened with, with people here listening, you know what? God desires repentance and restoration. That's the heart of God. And we're going to see that here in just a few minutes, even more so. All right, chapter 22. Look at verse 18. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. He who sacrifices to any god except to the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. Hmm. Kill somebody who practices sorcery, bestiality, idolatry? Is this harsh? What about a freedom for a person to do as they wish? I get that argument a lot when people find these little verses in the Old Testament and say, what about this? 
And you know what they're doing? It's actually, they're trying to deflect their own sin to say, oh, look at all this and don't look at my sin. That's what they're doing. But let's talk about this. Again, like other previous laws, this was a protection to the people. See, all three of these things had to do with paganism. Pagan religion, which of course is demonic. Sorcery, witchcraft, psychics, astrology, all up and down Route 9. How often do you see them? You're driving up. I don't care if you're in Bass River, all the way to Barnegat and past Ware Town and all oh, up and down. There must be about 10 or 12 of them, right? All these psychics and all these type of things. Here's the deal with those. It's very real. Do you know why it's real? Because it's demonically empowered. It's deceptive. It's dark. It's luring. It's enticing. Have you guys ever noticed there that some people are just drawn toward darkness? You know, not to be legalistic, but you know, when there's that those darkness. Got to be careful of dabbling in the darkness, even some horror movies, right? It's like, why would I want to look at demons and all these type of things? And, and, and all, all that's really doing is that's just opening yourself up to, to demonic oppression. Not to be legalistic, but again, it's a protection saying, hey, you know what? I already got enough problems. I don't need extra demons coming and harassing me, right? Now, pagan religions often include human sacrifice, torture, sexual immorality, and drug use slash drug dealing. Where do I get that from? Well, the Bible tells us this. Galatians chapter 5. Notice this. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and there's like six or seven sins included in this, but we're just talking, we're narrowing it down to sorcery, okay? Okay. So, the works of the flesh are evident, which are sorcery. And the Greek word is what? Pharmakia. Does that sound like an English word that we have? Pharmacy, where you get your prescription drugs. And so, a lot of times, sorcery, witchcraft, has to do with drug use. You know, even in... in um, Native American cultures, back where I'm from in New Mexico, um, a lot of Native Americans there, and what happens? They would use peyote to enter into altered states of consciousness, and they would be talking to demons and commuting with their spirit guides. No, these are just demons, right? And, and drug use really can open up into the demonic realm. And so God is saying, I, and so it says that those who practice those things will not inherit the kingdom of God right? God is protective of both people's physical lives, their property, right? If you, you know, if you accidentally burn somebody's, you know, house down, you, you got to make restitution for it. But also God is protective of people's spiritual lives. Why? Because especially if, there, if, if sorcery and witchcraft and horror movies and all these type of things weren't effective, if they didn't entice people well there wouldn't be six or seven eight nine ten you know psychics and mediums and and they wouldn't make all these movies and there wouldn't be all these practices with them if they weren't enticing well then you know there wouldn't be a market for them but they are very enticing they are very luring and they can cause people to get involved in in really demonic worship and really the the point is is god doesn't want anybody to be involved in that. Why? Because then they'll go to hell, right? God wants everyone to be saved. So these are protective measures. Even Jesus. Jesus gets pretty bold when he's protecting little children. What does Mark chapter 9 tell us? These are the words of Jesus, okay? It says, but if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with the large millstone hung around your neck. So, this is a warning to teachers in our public schools and school administrations and, and to school boards and those of us who vote for certain school board members and that, you know, those policies, right? Because what are they doing? They are teaching ungodly policies 
or ungodly ideologies to our kids. Even those biology teachers who purposely go out of their way to say, hey, you weren't created. There is no God. You evolved in the Big Bang and all that kind of stuff. These people will be held accountable before God. Even what's, what, what they're teaching in Hollywood, Hollywood's opinions. Now, it's very easy to say, yeah, they're doing that and they're teaching this and they're you know, doing this sin and that and my kids this and that. It's very easy to point the finger. But what about our lives? Are we doing anything? that are causing any one of our loved ones or, or other people's, you know, kids to fall away from the Lord. And often that comes by us as Christians when we're hypocritical. We say one thing, everything's great at church, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you got your Bible and, you, you know, it's all underlined and this and that, but at home we're a different person, right? We have to be careful that our lives match up with um, the principles of Christianity. All right. So we've spoken today about God's protection, and there's a lot of judgment, a lot of consequences. Why? Because justice demands consequences. And some people get the idea, where are we at now? We're in the Old Testament. Some people get the idea that the Old Testament is that it's all judgment, and God's just in a really bad mood. Okay? And so he's out to get people. If you mess up, man, you better watch out. You better run and hide because God's coming after you. That's sometimes the idea that people get about God. And then by the time the Old Testament or the New Testament comes along, God kind of is a lot older and he gets a little softer and, you know, okay, well, I'll just forgive everybody, you know, and through Jesus. Okay, we're dead, you know. And so some people get the, the misconception that the Old Testament's all judgment. And that the New Testament is all God's grace and forgiveness. Actually, read the book of Revelation. Not so much, uh, you know, not so much grace and forgiveness. It's offered there, but book of Revelation, a lot of judgment there too. So how does this all work out? Well, the Old Testament Bible verse, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, right? We've spoken about justice, to love mercy. What's mercy? Mercy is withholding a punishment that somebody rightfully deserves. They've done something and they deserve punishment, judgment, negative consequences, whatever. Mercy is saying, I'm not going to do that. To love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Humility comes saying, hey, you know what? I'm a sinner too. And I deserve God's judgment, God's punishment. Let's talk about loving mercy. You see, God desires for people to repent and to be forgiven. And even in the Old Testament, think about the book of Jonah. Jonah was called to go to who? The Ninevites the Assyrians. And we went through the book of Jonah several months ago. And you might remember that the Assyrians, the Ninevites, they were horrible, evil, murderous, torturous, sexually immoral people. They were pagans. They practiced what? Witchcraft and sorcery. They did so many bad things that God said to Jonah, you go warn them. Well, eventually after Jonah you know, was uh, swallowed by this great fish and, and kind of said, okay, God, I'll, I'll, I'll follow you. What happened? He went there and they repented. You see, God, God is willing. He longs for people to repent. Even bad people like these Assyrians, these murderers, these immoral people, these people who practice witchcraft and sorcery and all those type of things. There's mercy in the Old Testament. That's the heart of God. There's, it's also there in the New Testament. Remember when they brought Jesus, this woman who was caught in adultery, and they wanted her, they wanted Jesus to, to cast the first stone and say, hey, let's kill her. And what did Jesus say? He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone, right? That's mercy. That's God wanting to forgive and restore. Now, what about when it says, go back to chapter 21. Chapter 21, look at verse 23. Chapter 21, verse 23. 
What about this verse, these verses? But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So, this was put in place to prevent escalation of revenge. All right. So you hit me once, I'm going to hit you twice. You know, I lost my eye, I'm going to make sure to get both of your eyes. It's like this. Sunday dinner, mashed potatoes, peas, meatloaf, got the kids sitting around, and one of the kids is playing with one of his little peas. What happens? Takes a pea, sees his sister, throws the pea at the sister. Well, she's not going to let her brother push him around, so she grabs a hold of a handful of peas and throws them back, and the parents are just, you know, in slow motion, saying, no, stop, you know. And what happens? By the time the, the handful of peas hit the, hit the brother, what's the brother got? He's loaded. He gets his spoon loaded with mashed potatoes and he does a, a catapult and he catapults the mashed potatoes to hit her sister's face and she's got, you know, she's got mashed potatoes all over her face. See, the idea is that people do what? You hurt me once, I'm going to hurt you twice. I'm going to get you back even that much more. So when it says eye for eye, tooth for tooth, this is not saying you must take out their eye if they, kill, if, they, if they poked out your eye or caused you to be blind in one eye. It's saying that is the limit. You can't go further than that. However, the Bible teaches that we do not have to retaliate. We don't have to retaliate because Jesus says what in Matthew chapter 5? He says, You have heard that it was said eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If any one of you slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Okay, so Jesus says you don't have to retaliate. You know, they hurt me, I'm going to hurt them back. You can just say, I'm not. I'm going to just forgive them. All right? Now, go to chapter 23. Chapter 23, look at verse 4. Chapter 23, verse 4. It says, if you meet your enemies, who? Your friend? Your best friend? No, your enemies. Ox. Or his donkey going astray. You say, too bad for them. Ha, ha, ha. They lost their ox. You know how much that costs? That's a $6,000 animal. <laughs> Justice. No. It says, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring, surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one uh, who hates you lying under its burden, you sh and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. Doesn't sound like eye for eye and tooth for tooth, right? So somebody's trash blows in your yard. What do you do? You collect it and dump it back all over their yard? No. You collect the trash, throw it away, and bring their trash can back to their yard. Or a dog. Your neighbor's dog gets in your yard and does what? Leaves things. What do you do? In your, in your heart, <laughs> in your heart we want to shoot them, or at least collect the things that do not belong to you but belong to his dog, bring them back, and maybe distribute them on his lawn or other, you know, his car or I don't know, whatever it is. You can be, you can be creative, right? I, I know what I would do in my evil heart, okay? You, you guys wouldn't believe what I would do. But anyway, the Bible says you know, that we don't have to retaliate. Why? Because the goal is somebody does something bad to us. Our goal is not to get them back. Our goal is to get them to Jesus. And so when they hurt us or they do something bad to us, 
Our goal is not to retaliate, but our goal is to use it as an opportunity to forgive and to build a bridge in order that we can share Jesus with that person. We are to rise above to Christ's level, right? Because that's what Jesus does. Now, all of us have sinned. We all deserve judgment. We all deserve for justice to be served against us. Normally, we would have gone through the Psalms, but today I, I skipped about 100 Psalms, well, about 75 Psalms, and we read Psalm 103. And I want to encourage you guys to read Psalm 103 this week, to make it this Psalm that you meditate on. It. There's a lot of great stuff in there, but notice what Psalm 103, verses 6 through 10 says. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. We've read about that, right? He made known his ways to Moses. That's what we're reading right now. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Here it is, right here. You and me. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor punished us according to our iniquities. You see, it's very easy to say, oh, they did this to me or they did that. Or look at how they're messing up society and they're messing up our country and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's very easy to do that. But we need to remember that God has not dealt according to me, according to my sins. I deserve judgment. You know what I deserve? I deserve to be cast into the lake of fire to burn forever and ever and ever. And yet God has given me mercy. Right? But see, God's a God of justice. Sin must be punished. That's justice. And obviously Jesus took my punishment. You see, injustice for all became and judgment on Jesus. You see, Jesus took the judgment. If you're saved, if you've asked Jesus into your hearts, you know what that means? You are free. You are enjoying the liberty of the forgiveness, the freedom from judgments. Now, remember our title this morning? And liberty and justification for all. Well, you read through the book of, of Romans and you're going to see this word justification all over the place. Here in Romans chapter 3, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's a fancy theological five-cent word, justification. Do you guys talk about justification on a daily basis? You like go up to somebody, you're checking out your groceries and goes, hey, you know I'm justified? And they're gonna be like, okay, thank you for coming, here's your receipt. And they're kinda like, okay, I, I got more customers. No, you don't talk about justification. That's not something that we talk about. But you know what justification means? Chuck Smith defines it like this. Just as if I'd never sinned, right? Because of Jesus, we are justified. He considers us just as if I'd never sinned, right? So you're saved. Our sins are forgiven. But anybody sin on a daily basis? I do. One of you. No, two. <laughs> the rest of you are lying. <laughs> you just sinned. No. All right. We sin on a daily basis, don't we? But what does 1 John tell us? The heart of God. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and what? Just. Just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, when we confess our sins, what are we doing? We are walking humbly with our God. We're saying, God, I don't have it all together. I sinned. I'm asking you for forgiveness. And on a daily basis, when we sin, and we ask God for, for forgiveness, what happens? We are enjoying the liberty from guilt, freedom from guilt and condemnation. What happens if you've hurt somebody else, you've sinned against somebody else? To walk humbly with your God means you humble yourself before other people and you say, I'm sorry, 
I've sinned, I've done this towards you. And you know what that does? That liberates you from pride. That liberates them from bitterness because you've hurt them. And it's amazing when somebody comes and apologizes to you and you've been, you've been building up bitterness in your heart. You know what you're doing? You're liberating them from, from bitterness. You can help them to overcome that, right? As recipients of God's mercy, we should love mercy. And if I really love God's mercy on me, remember what's God's mercy? I deserve, deserve punishment, and yet God doesn't give me punishment. Why? Because of Jesus. If I really love mercy, then what will I do? I will show mercy to others, right? I'm not going to get revenge on them. I'm going to show mercy to those who've hurt me. Whether they've asked for forgiveness or not, we need to still show mercy and forgiveness. For us as Christians, showing mercy and, and, and forgiving others, it's not optional, right? Sometimes there are, you, know, you, you go through some things and this is an optional checkbox here. No, for Christians, showing mercy and forgiving other people is not an option. It's part of who we are as Christians. So because of Jesus, there's liberty and justification for all who believe. You guys frustrated with this world? It gets frustrating, doesn't it? Especially if you, if you have a pulse and you've ever seen the news in the last you know, year. It's frustrating. It's getting bad. It's worse and worse. And sometimes we might say, yeah, God, can't wait. You're going to bring justice, right? Remember, Jesus is going to set things right when he comes back. Jesus is going to set things right. In a minute, we're going to sing a line in the song that says, there will be justice, all will be new. God's going to set it all right. You just stay close to Jesus. And until he sets things right in this world, this is our job. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so, Lord, we thank you so much.